the deathless dream, the eternal poetry, and the perennial sense that life is miracle and magic. And we need it now more than ever. Not at some time in the future when things seem easier. We need it now, precisely because it renews our hearts and souls. Because we crave something to believe in. We crave something to reach for, to wonder about. Life is miracle and magic. Sometimes we need to be reminded so we don't miss our moments in time. So we began to ask ourselves at DARPA, where did it come from, this sense of wonder? I'm not sure I know. I reread Kennedy's speeches. We had brainstorming sessions. We listened to others' accounts of stories. We listed attributes. It was high risk. It had an uncertain outcome, something that had never been done before, a definable end state, something that was accessible by way of a goal line, perhaps a gifted <coughs> spokesperson, the right time, the exact right time for the nation. I worked on it. My brain didn't seem big enough. A small group of us worked on it, and we made some progress. But mostly, we got stuck. Turns out that designing a renaissance of wonder, well, it's really hard to do. Really hard. So in parallel, we've been developing a new, th a new thesis. It arose during a joint meeting with U.S. Transportation Command, Transcom. Well, it seems that war creates very vexing logistics problems <coughs> on a massive scale, highly dynamic and massive problems. Many at this meeting with Transcom argued for an omniscient, omnipresent computer program and database, something with perfect knowledge about where everything was in what state it was in the shipping. Well, our spidey sense, our blink sense, knew that was the wrong tactic. Humans had an intuition about the problem that wasn't being recognized. The evidence was found in gunnery sergeants and master sergeants who had been collectively making logistics more efficient for years. So we started toying with the idea of expanding their cognitive power to a larger social network, facilitating it. And it struck me. Social media, social networking today is in its infancy, and yet already powerful. Many people think it's an idle endeavor, more about finding an old high school sweetheart than about a transformative force in the world. They consider it almost frivolous, but it's not. Social networking is a tool that solves diverse problems from folding novel proteins to mapping hay what it permits is access to the cognitive power of large, diverse groups. The group can be small with its power measured in its diversity. Computer scientists, social scientists, economists, economists and engineers working on a skunkwork style project. Or large with, it, with its power measured in many people globally searching for red balloons or other items. Ultimately, its real power is measured when we begin to harness the cognitive power of billions of people. In a generation, that cognitive power, that pool, 
is measured in about 9 billion people. And much like the power that was realized in cloud computing, we will begin to realize the power of the collective human race, the cognitive cloud. So what is it? How powerful might it be? We don't know, but we are starting to. James Surowiecki started, starts his book, The Wisdom of the Crowds, with a story of a British scientist named Francis Galton. Now, Galton conducted experiments that left him with little faith in the intelligence of the average person. And I quote, the stupidity and wrong-headedness of men and women being so great as to be scarcely credible. He argued that only if power and control stayed in the hands of a select, well-bred few could a society remain healthy and strong. A bit of an elitist, you might say, back often. You can imagine his dissatisfaction when he discovered that the crowd's judgment was essentially perfect. Here's the story of that discovery. Galton was obsessed with breeding for obvious reasons. So he went to the west of England fat stock and poultry exhibition, which arguably should be a very big showcase for the effects of good and bad breeding. He came across a weight judging competition. A fat ox had been selected, and for six pence, you could place a wager on the weight of the ox after it had been slaughtered and dressed. 800 people tried their luck in the competition. They were a diverse lot. There were butchers and farmers, presumably experts, and many so-called non-experts. The analogy to democracy suggested itself to Galton immediately. And remember his little pesky elitist tendency? Well, Galton really wanted to prove that the average voter was capable of very little. And he argued that the average competitor probably was as well fitted for making a just estimate of the weight of the ox as an average voter was of making judgments on the merits of the most political, politically difficult issues on which he votes. He turned the competition into an experiment. After the competition was over and prizes were awarded, he borrowed the tickets and ran the statistics on them to see if they would form a bell curve. He also calculated the mean of the group's guesses. He was essentially asking the question, if the crowd were a single person representing the collective wisdom of the Punith area in this case, how would they fare in the competition? Undoubtedly, he expected the average guess of the group would be way off the mark. Mix a few smart people with some mediocre people and lots of dumb people, and you should get a dumb answer. Dalton was wrong. The crowd guessed the ox's weight as 1,197 pounds, actual weight after slaughter and dress, 1,198 pounds, closer than any expert in the craft. Now, Surowiecki's book is about just this, that under the right circumstances, groups are remarkably intelligent and are often smarter than the smartest people in them. Now, we often make a mistake in interpreting this result because we don't believe or we don't want to believe that the crowd itself is smart. We are much more likely to attribute the success of the crowd 
to a few smart people in it than to the crown itself. We chase the expert, perhaps in part because this absolves us of responsibility. The really hard problems that we face are for someone else, for the experts. Surawiki argues that we should stop chasing the experts because it's a mistake. We should ask the crowd, which of course includes all the geniuses as well as everyone else. Chances are the crowd knows. Throughout the book, Surawiki shows how the crowd not only solves simple problems, like guessing the weight of an ox, but also exceedingly complex problems where no one person knows the answer to even pieces of the problem, much less the whole. And quite remarkably, in case after case, the group knows the answers to them all. It almost feels like miracle and magic. It definitely makes us wonder. Now, Scott Page wrote a book after Surawiecki called The Difference. And it is the wisdom of the crowds on steroids. Page begins to build a foundation for the power of the crowd. He builds mathematical, statistical, rich, elegant scientific theorems and proofs. He offers a conjecture. The, di the diversity conjecture states that diversity leads to better outcomes, and specifically, cognitive diversity. The ability to represent problems, categorize perspectives, generate solutions, infer cause and effect. Page argues that often diversity trumps ability. Different perspectives, we know, can lead to breakthroughs. Diverse perspectives give rise to innovation. And the right perspective can make a seemingly difficult problem appear trivial. It's difficult, perhaps, to conceptualize this in the abstract. So what I want to do is walk you through an experiment, an example. So Herbert Simon, a computer and political scientist who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics, created a game called Sum to 15. In the game, nine cards, numbered one through nine, are laid on a table face up. Now, one player is randomly chosen to go first, and then players alternate taking cards. The objective of the game <coughs> is to collect three cards that sum to 15. The game has two contradicting incentives. A player must build combinations that can sum to 15 while simultaneously blocking the other player's ability to do so. So, let's try. Player A and player B. Move one. Player A chooses the five, and thus needs 10 more points to get to 15. Player B chooses the three, and therefore needs 12 more points to get to 15. <coughs> Move three. Player A chooses the two, and thus needs eight more points to get to 15. <coughs> Player B chooses the eight for the block, which means that four more points are needed to get to 15. Player A chooses the four for the block. Now since player A, player B chose four, that leaves player A with a six or a nine needed to get to 15. Player B chooses the six for the block. Player A chooses the nine for the win. Seems a bit challenging. But, if we reorganize the cards and look at it from another perspective, 
will play the game again. Now what we're going to do here is I'll play the game the exact same moves on the right hand side of the screen. You watch the left hand side of the screen. Player A and player B. Player A chooses the 5, player B chooses the 3, player A chooses the 2, player B chooses 8, player A chooses 4 for the block, B chooses 4, A has 6 or 9. Win. Right? Okay, now it doesn't appear so challenging. Tic-tac-toe, a game that any three-year-old can play. And here, is the power of diversity realized. A different perspective, one person with a different perspective changes the game forever for everyone. And that's why diversity in the crowd matters and why diversity often trumps ability. <coughs> Now, Paige argues that diverse perspectives cut both ways, because for every brilliant perspective that changes a difficult situation into an easy one, there may be a multitude of perspectives that muck up our understanding of strategic context. Being diverse in a relevant way often proves hard. Being diverse in an irrelevant way is easy. And this is one of the best parts of Paige's work. He scrubs out hyperbole, he's grounded and authentic, he wonders and then he dares to unlock some of the mystery. He pushes back against the tendency towards averaging in the crowd. He argues it is not about simple regression to the mean, rather for both pragmatic reasons and aesthetic reasons. It is important to retain an understanding of the complexity. Pragmatic reasons to highlight the value of looking beyond the means, and for aesthetics, to call attention to what Janet Malcolm calls the gorgeousness of the particulars of things that are alive in the world. Page says that the single word that jumps to his mind in thinking about diversity is wonder. It is not frivolity. The power of social networking, the power of the crowd, the cognitive cloud, is so much more than winning wagers on the weight of an ox, or a car game, <coughs> or connecting with a high school sweetheart. The progression of power in the network has advanced like this. From Sarnoff's power of N, in the early days of radio, to Metcalf's power then squared to describe when radios can talk to each other rather than simply receive, to Reed's power now of two to the nth power, the power law of groups or of social networks. We're just starting to understand how the cognitive cloud can solve real problems from the innocence and wonder of finding red balloons to the nefarious activities of flash mobs. And many, many important tasks in between. So, on the 40th anniversary of the internet, DARPA announced the Red Balloon Challenge. And on December 5th, 2009, we launched 10 eight-foot red weather balloons in undisclosed locations throughout the continental United States. The first person or team to report correctly the locations of all 10 balloons was awarded $40,000. <coughs> 4,367 teams registered in the DARPA challenge. The winning team, the MIT team, did what many said could not be done. They correctly reported the location of all 10 balloons in an astonishingly short eight hours and 52 minutes. 10 balloons in undisclosed locations throughout the entire continental United States. 
eight hours and 52 minutes. And they used a network of 5,000 individuals that started from just four initial nodes and formed in fewer than two days in a social network. And that wasn't unusual. Indeed, a significant number of the top finishers launched their team mobilization with only one or two days notice. Teams built around existing networks were able to mobilize their networks in less than a day. And in one case, a highly connected individual successfully mobilized his contacts through Twitter in less than one hour. This was the young kid who originally unleashed the iPhone. Same kid, a few years older. He rolled out of bed on the morning of the challenge, tweeted his entire network, and in one hour had seven out of ten balloon locations. One hour. The Red Balloon Challenge demonstrated at convincing scale the speed, adaptability, and power of social networks. And it has become a bit iconic, in part because it has a certain undeniability to it. And it has provided first ever concrete, large-scale scientific data about the formation and behaviors of social networks and problem solving. One of the most common objectives to the utility of activities involving the crowd, such as the Red Balloon Challenge, is that one will not be able to sort real reports from <coughs> false reports. The challenge was the largest scale social networking experience experiment that we were aware of where there was an adversarial component. Namely, people wanted to, to defeat others for the cash. And as a result, many people put false reports into the system to try and throw off their competitors. The nerd fighters, that was an existing social group, the nerd fighters had an explicit strategy to this effect. And overall, in the competition, the number of false reports to the number of real reports exceeded, the number of false reports exceeded the number of real reports by a factor of four to one. And interestingly, sorting truth from false information was one of the most important aspects of winning. What we know is that social media, social networks have truth in them. We just don't have all the tools yet to identify that truth. We're beginning. And as an example of the balloon challenge, natural noise in the system was an indicator of truth. When balloon locations were reported in rapid succession with the exact same lat long to three significant digits, then it was likely a false report. When the reports came in with slightly different time stamps and slightly differing locations, they were more likely to be correct. Why? Because that's how multiple humans would report. And thus, natural noise in the system was reflective of confirming reports from more than one individual. And that natural noise became a filter for truth. That truth looks very different from the conventional truth of our intelligence system, where truth is defined by authentication of source. If the source can be authenticated, what comes out the pipe, we set the bit as true. Now, it may be wrong, but we set the bit as true. Truth in a social network doesn't look like that. But that doesn't mean truth doesn't exist in that network. Now, Trapster is another application, another example of how the network operates to reveal and reward truth. Trapster is an application for a GPS-enabled iPhone Users report the locations of speed traps, and those who are part of the network get an announcement in their vehicles when they're approaching a speed trap on their iPhone. Now, you may be interested to know that we had at least one office director at DARPA who was commuting from Pittsburgh, and Trapster saved him from losing his driver's license, <laughs> as, well, because he has a bit of a lead foot problem. <laughs> Now, most people initially say Trapster won't work. 
because the police or others will simply flood the system with reports and you won't be able to trust the system. Not the case. As it turns out, the network has the ability to vote whether or not the announced speed trap was accurate. A thumbs up vote if the speed trap is really there, thumbs down if it's not. And if you as an individual in the network report correctly, more than incorrectly, your standing in the social network increases. There is no way, it is impossible, to improve your standing by putting false information in the system. It's not possible. You must put accurate information in the system. And the social network begins to identify truth. Now, what if I told you that a 13-year-old could derive a cure for cancer? It's more possible than you think. Zoran Popovich and others developed a program, a game called Folded. It's a protein folding game, and it's designed to put games into science rather than science into games. Folded illustrates the power of the cognitive cloud when paired with serious computational capabilities. Last year, Wired Magazine reported a nail-biting play-by-play of the battle between a 43-year-old Paris-based marketing manager and a 13-year-old American boy who were in fierce competition to solve a protein folding puzzle. Since the launch of Folded in May of 2008, some 150,000 people have participated. On average, 200 new users per day sign on to solve puzzles for science. Folded draws more than 100,000 hits per month, and the top five individual players have no more than a high school level biochemistry background. The participants in Folded win protein folding competitions. And in so doing, they discovered the proteins. This science-oriented crowdsourcing may perhaps ultimately aid in uncovering the cure for cancer, but it is also <coughs> demonstrating that crowds can learn complex tasks. Indeed, protein folding is about as complex as biochemistry gets. And in addition to the very specific gains for science, Folded is uncovering savants in the most unlikely places. 43-year-old marketing managers and 13-year-old boys. And the implications are broad. The Iranian election illustrated the power of the crowd in a different way. The Iran Twitter revolution changed our thinking. Although Iran is classified as a developing country, it has a young and highly literate population. Almost half the population, 48.5%, is online. This statistic became most evident in the wake of the highly disputed 2009 presidential election. Although traditional communications in Iran were largely censored, social media became a vehicle through which dissidents could protest and connect with the rest of the world. At its peak, there were over 221,000 Iran tweets in one hour, and more than 2.2 million blog posts mentioning Iran over the course of 24 hours. The tragic video of one dissident's death swept YouTube and captured headlines around the world. The crowd found a way. <coughs> a way to communicate, to make their voices heard, and it became a story about the young and new, how they organized, how they protested, how they fought for freedom in their country. In January of last year, a social network motivated by humanitarian aims mapped Haiti in support of relief efforts. It was built on a platform called Yushahidi, originally developed in Kenya. From no map around Port-au-Prince to a near complete map in 18 days. Roads, buildings, supplies, requests for help, offers of aid. Now, 
With every opportunity, there are also risks. And you may have heard or even read about, perhaps even experienced yourself firsthand, the collective action of what we now call a flash mob. That's the name given to a group of people who use social network and viral texting to suddenly show up in a public place and perform some act. Provocative street performers, full-blown Broadway musical routines, even massive pillow fights spring up from nowhere and then just as suddenly disperse. But in March of last year, one playful tweet sent out to organize an instant street party led to a very different outcome. Authorities in Philadelphia say a nighttime call to teens to gather downtown rapidly gained momentum. First, there were a few score milling about a 10 block commercial district, but they were soon joined by hundreds, and they just kept coming. Within minutes, an estimated 2,000 teenagers overran the downtown streets in what city officials said was a flash mob that quickly turned dangerous. There were multiple assaults. There were injuries. Teens jumped on cars and blocked traffic. Pedestrians ran in fear. There were arrests that led ultimately to felony convictions. One eyewitness, a local merchant, described the scene as a tsunami of kids. This rampaging flash mob was part bullying, part <coughs> running with the bulls. And as teens sprinted down city blocks, they sometimes paused to brawl with one another, assault bystanders and bystanders and vandalize property. Okay. So how do we tie this all together? We seek to solve a problem. An example for us was how to create a renaissance of wonder. An individual struggles to find it. A small group makes some progress. We ask ourselves, what if we ask the crowd? What if we use the cognitive cloud to get unstuck, to find that renaissance of wonder? How would we do that? How would we build the cognitive cloud to do that? How would we screen options? How would we decide? How do we make it diverse? How would we involve artists, engineers, scientists, politicians, farmers, auto workers, teachers, preachers, students? What if you use it to initiate, participate, organize, and start work on a problem that you previously thought was not solvable, for which you are personally not an expert and thus have every reason to step away? What if being a subject matter expert is less important now than bringing a new way of looking at a problem. Because the truth is, one of the things we're learning about social media, social networking, is that there are no more excuses. On May 25, 1961, President Kennedy addressed Congress. In his address, he said, I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. In a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. If we make this judgment affirmatively, it will be an entire nation. For all of us must work to put him there. If we are to go only halfway or reduce our sights in the face of difficulty, in my judgment, it will be better not to go at all. That's daring. Fifty years later, yesterday marked the anniversary of Kennedy's inauguration, 
and four months from now, May 25, 2011, will mark the anniversary of his famous moon landing speech. What will be next? What will captivate us all? Children and grandparents, people of all nations, people who will believe, hope, sit on the edge of their seats, what will inspire that renaissance of wonder? So today I am asking you, scientists, citizen scientists, to be part of the cognitive cloud. Not because you are an expert, but because you are uniquely you because you have something unique to contribute. And in the cognitive cloud, that makes all the difference. It's too new to know exactly where this is going. But I will tell you this. It's become deeply personal to us at DARPA. Sputnik gave rise to the Moon program and Sputnik gave rise to DARPA. Wonder matters to us, and it matters to the world. And you can help find it. I'll ask that you leave here tonight believing that this connectivity, this power, the power of the cognitive cloud, well, it is a part of you and you are a part of it. Don't move back into the groove of your life and let this pass you by. Pick something and go. This is your time to be daring. Don't lose your nerve. Thank you, Dr. Dugan. You'll take some questions sure. from the audience. Absolutely. And it is a little hard to hear in this room, so when you're asking your question, if you would please stand, it will help us. Sure. Am I moderating? Would you, is that yeah. fine? Go right ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <coughs> My name is Ben. Thank you for coming. Um, I have a pretty simple question. So there's, a, there's an enemy to this type of thing, yeah. and that is fear. And in Temporally constrained objective experiments, you see that the cloud works extremely well. Mm -hmm. But in temporally diverse experiments, you see that this thing, fear, emotion, whatever it is, um, starts to poison the cloud. Starts to change the beliefs of the cloud. So how, in a temporally sort of elongated sense, do you allow people to verify their beliefs against those emotions. Against the fear. Exactly. Um, it's a good question. You know, my, my uncle, who is uh, part of the financial world, has a saying. He says that men lose their mind rapidly and in herds, and they regain their senses slowly as individuals. And um, so what you're describing is that phenomenon, right? The racing away of something in a flash of emotion or fear. Um, you know, I think that our ability to do what the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology recently called a crowdsourcing compiler, um, we, we don't yet know how to do that, okay? We, we understand that there are certain environments in which the crowd functions extremely well, and there are certain environments where the crowd doesn't function so well. And it may not be that it has a nefarious outcome. It may just be that it's a flop. It doesn't work, right? We don't yet know the landscape of parameters that govern when it does and when it doesn't work. 
We don't yet know when it turns to good and when it turns to nothing or even evil. What we know is that there is intense power in that collective cognition, in that cloud. And that to step away from it would be naive. Somewhere in that power is the ability, somewhere in our learning, our knowledge, our growing knowledge, is the ability to understand how to harness it and how to harness it for the right purposes. We know from the things that we've done that the incentive structure really matters. How you incent the crowd to an outcome, whether it be street cred for winning a game and protein folding, or $40,000 for finding 10 red weather balloons. Incenting the crowd to the appropriate outcomes is important. And the other thing that we know is that if you try and hold on to it too tight, you won't get the power of it. There is this element of letting it go. The, the MIT team that won the Red Balloon Challenge, we could not have anticipated how they did it. Right? If we had tried to constrain the strategies for winning that balloon challenge, we would have had nothing of the power of the crowd. So um, it's a good question, and it's the appropriate, um, I think, nuancing of this developing field. I just don't have an answer for you yet. You're going to have to work on it. Ben. <laughs> ben, somebody write his name down. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't understand the role of dark here, because if you're trying to guess the number of beans in a jar, or the weight of the ox, or protein folding looks like a pack of candy, that's one thing. But you're saying that in 1905, you could take the collective wisdom of people and you would get the theory of relativity, or more recently, Brian Drucker, who got the cleavage for uh, leukemia, that would happen by some group thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't believe that, and I don't think to me that that's Darpa's role. You should be looking for people like that, not the number of beans in the jar. Okay, I love this challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Because this is exactly the response that people have. They want to search for the expert. And I will tell you that in Page's book, one of the things that he writes about is the nature of problems that work with the crowd and the nature of problems that don't. So we can be clear that not all problems will work for the crowd. Okay, We'll put aside the issue of DARPA for now. Let me just convince you how important this is, or try to. Okay. Um, Page says that there are two types of problems. It was originally done by a researcher by the name of Steiner. And he described the two problems in the following way. I'll shorthand them for you. In the first problem, we'll call it the vexing math problem. In the first problem, the vexing math problem, the contribution of any one individual that advances our understanding of how to solve it, advances it for the entire group. Those kinds of problems work very well with the crowd. The other type of problem, we'll call it the offensive line problem. Any one break in the line and the quarterback gets sacked. Those problems don't work so well in the crowd. So what we see is that for very difficult problems, and many of us have observed this in our own scientific careers, one person with a different perspective unlocks the secret to seeing the problem differently, to understanding how to get to a different solution. And when you involve a diversity of people with differing perspectives on the problem, your probability of seeing the problem differently, uncovering that solution, goes up and it goes up disproportionate to your expectation. Disproportionate to your expectation. You, again, remember back, we talked about Galton. Most people want to believe that the power of the crowd is in the individual experts in the crowd. It is not. The crowd itself is wise. The crowd itself, the perspective brought by a variety of people in the crowd that advance the understanding of how to solve that vexing math problem leads us to much higher probability 
of actually solving it. Much higher probability. And you may not believe me today, but one day you will. Yes. Yes. Okay, hold on one second. Right there and then you. Thank you for your visit here. I'm trying to understand some the apparent disconnect mm -hmm. uh, between the uh, the main mission of DARPA and the uh, uh, some of the theses uh, of Scott Page. Scott is a, is a social scientist, and one of the ways in which he's able to contribute these ideas today is because he actually builds on 200 years of social science, uh, which is his native upbringing. Scott Page is a theoretical mathematician. Yes, but... Maybe not talking about the same page. No, I don't. Yeah, he's don't a theoretical mathematician. But it's not deeply grounded in social science. Well, and he, obviously, he's applied his deep understanding of mathematical principles to the study of the crowd. That's... That is definitely his intersection of study. Mm -hmm. So, so well, my question is: the surely the uh, the, the spontaneous idea mm -hmm. that comes from uh, uh, without prior deep knowledge in the field sometimes can have truly innovative impact. Mm -hmm. True. Uh, but to, to, to put the stakes, to put the stake of a nation in, uh, in, uh, in occasional improvisation <coughs> as opposed to harnessing, amongst other things, also you know, well developed uh, knowledge of networks that have been studied in, in sociology and social science for 200 years now. Uh, that, I'm trying to understand how to reconcile these because surely you don't want to to say that uh, a great deal of work in that area should be uh, uh, set aside no. for the empirical phenomena that we're seeing in social media. So, so one of the things I want um, to just notice is how we talk about even social media or social networking. You'll note that the hand gestures that are associated with them go like this, right? Um, where we're, wherein we talk about other fields with much quieter even gestures. And, and you can see themes of a belief that this is frivolity even in how we talk about it, right? So, so what I will tell you is that I absolutely am not suggesting that every scientific endeavor or every project or every problem that we have should be simply given over to the crowd and hope for the best. I'm not saying that. What I am saying, however, is that the power of the cognitive cloud is as yet unrealized and a very significant force indeed. And we are just beginning to understand what that represents. And as for DARPA's role, well, this is part of our role, to, to uncover, to unlock new types, new ways of both solving problems and harnessing power. I mean, look, there's, there's a Google mashup site uh, called um, North Korea Uncovered. North Korea Uncovered is a, is a map representation of the power of 35,000 people who annotated North Korea. They essentially crowdsourced that picture of, now, of North Korea. All of the important parliamentary sites, all the important military installations, and so on. And with a social network, they built an adaptable virtual satellite. That's what they built. That's relevant. In fact, it really calls into question the traditional ways of doing it. Because there is very little that is adaptable on the scale of a highly adaptable adversary other than human beings themselves using the tools around them. Yeah? Well, two questions. Mm -hmm. What are the necessary conditions for crowd power? <laughs> In other words, what experiments would refute? 
power of the crowd to be effective. Second, do you think that something like cold fusion would be an interesting challenge? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll assume your second question was tongue-in-cheek, so I'll take, I'll take the first one. Um, so again, I, I should be careful to not represent that we understand everything about the crowd. This is nascent, this is emerging, yet we feel it as an extremely powerful force. We experience it as a very powerful force. So um, I can't answer, much like the first question, I cannot answer for you yet the parameters under which we can compile the, the power of the crowd and understanding of that. Um, we, have, we have early knowledge that indicates under what conditions it may or may not work. A problem that is so difficult that not one individual can solve it that tends to be representative of problems that the crowd works on and solves. Um, there, are, there are other um, elements of it that have to do with simply how you incent it. So it may not be only the problem itself, but how you incentivize finding the solution that has as much to do with the success or failure of the crowd as the problem statement itself, right? And, um, I'll just have to think about the issue of the fusion. I don't know how to answer it right now. There? Okay, how about if we take two more questions? One here and then one there. There's more yeah. of a comment than a question. To me, it sounds like Linux, open source. Yep. You, you, look, you want the many people coming in for the solution. But some of this is cultural bias. Because, for example, to use specifics, if you gather 700 or 1,000 Bedouin and you ask them questions that are outside of their cultural understanding, how can you possibly come up with a correct answer? I mean, maybe you can, but does that make any sense? Well, remember, we said that a unique perspective that contributes to the problem rather than makes it you know, more unsettled or more difficult uh, to interpret is the real challenge, right? So um, I think that, remember what we're talking about here is cognitive diversity, which is different than identity diversity. Many times they're interchanged because identity diversity gives rise to different experiences and therefore gives you different perspectives, but they are not one and the same. You can have a very different identity diversity and have it be very uniform in its cognitive sense and vice versa. So quite, quite obviously the problem has to be posited to a group in a way that they can understand it, otherwise they can't contribute. I mean, that, that would certainly be a starting condition. Okay, one question there. My question actually directly follows, is directly linked. You said that there are problems for which the crowd power works and problems for which they don't. Right. And you said that the crowd is wise. To me, it sounds like the crowd is wise when asked the right question. So you classify two types of problems, the vexing math problem and the offensive line problem. Mm -hmm. Is there any way of studying, is there any track of study about how to cast one type of problem as the yeah. vexing math type of problem yeah. that the crowd can? That's a great question. And in fact, one of the things that we've begun to look at, and part of the reason this area of study is important for us, is that we look at certain problems uh, wherein we are struggling with them precisely because we have them cast as offensive line problems. Cybersecurity is a good example of that, right? One break in the line and we compromise the system. Can we recast the problem so that it becomes a vexing math problem we can utilize every person in the network as a cyber reserve core, so to speak, so as to solve the problem. And therein lies exactly the question. If you want to be able to utilize the crowd, you have to be able to cast the problem in a way and incentivize them properly to the solution. Um, I can't give you a formula for that yet. Okay. 
So we said we'd stop here. <laughs> <laughs> with this plaque, signed by all the members of the General Committee. Thank you so much for being here.